Well, good morning. It's very good to see you this morning at Calvary Baptist Church. I'm Pastor Curtis, and uh, it's a great day to worship the Lord together this morning. Hey, I'd like to start off by asking, did anyone catch the word of the day? A few people. Okay, ready? Three, two, one. Dedicate, okay, and this morning we're going to have some baby dedications at church service a little bit, but, um, but also it's a great morning to dedicate yourself to the Lord too. Dedicate your life to the Lord and say, Jesus, I want to follow you. I want to follow your plan for my life. So as these babies are dedicated, maybe we can sort of step back up to the plate and say, you know what, I want to, I want to dedicate myself to the Lord. And you've never, if you've never done that, you came to the right place this morning to learn all about Jesus and dedicating your life to him. Amazing. Part of that this morning is a communion service. This is for believers, people who have dedicated their life to him, to Jesus. And so if you didn't get one of these communion cups on the way in, make sure you slip out and maybe grab one. Uh, see one of the ushers to get, get your communion cup this morning. But that's an important part of our service today. So please do have one. We also have these connect cards. And so if you're joining with us for the first time this morning, we would love for you to fill one of these out. They're in the pew backs. And um, just let us know you're here and say, so we can say hello to you later on this week. Drop these in the offering plates as you go out. We'd be very thankful if you did fill one of these out this morning. But you can fill these out with prayer requests too. Maybe this is your second, third, or hundredth time here. And you can fill these out with prayer requests. We love to pray for you that way as well. This Sunday morning, there's a lot going on, isn't it? Communion Sunday, Dedication Sunday, there's a lot going on in the bulletin. We've got a lot to announce. But one thing I don't want you to miss out on is the alms offering plates are here. That's a way that we help people in our church family or people in our community when times are tough or things are happening that they didn't expect, expect to happen. And so alms offering plates are available this morning if you have a little extra cash maybe or something, a little extra gift to give to the alms fund. We'd be thankful for that. Tonight is a very exciting night for two reasons. Number one, kids get to celebrate their saying their verses and coming to Awana faithfully all year. That is awesome. It's our Awana closing ceremony. We're going to come here and celebrate with them. You're all invited to come and be a part of that ceremony tonight at 5 p.m. That is super awesome. And if it wasn't good enough already that, there's an ice cream party afterwards free ice cream. So you can't beat that. Celebrating kids, free ice cream. Those, are, those two go hand in hand, okay, perfectly. So please do join us if you'd like this, this evening for that. We have a couple of things that are coming up and um, just want to remind you, some of you dads like me who need this reminder, Mother's Day is next Sunday. So that's more about uh, you dads from getting that reminder than anything, but we do have that. And next Sunday as well in the evening, we're going to have Baccalaureate which is just a Christian celebration of graduates. And so they're going to be here at the church. We're going to be celebrating them. And so if you have a graduate or you'd like to come out and support the graduates, those who are coming, please do that. That'd be a great night to see you out for baccalaureate. Well, um, Sunday, May 15th, some of our missionaries are going to be here presenting in church service. So don't miss out on that. If you lo love missions and you, you won't, don't want to miss that Sunday, be here with us to celebrate as they come. And then the other thing that I, that I want to let you know about is coming up is the, the quarterly business meeting, Wednesday night, 7 p.m., May 18th. So if you're a member, or even if you're a non-member at Calvary, that's really important for you to be there. We'd love to see you at that, a good time of updates, a good time of fellowship, and to hear what we've been doing and what we're going to be doing as a church family. So that's a really important morning to be out for that as well. Hey, we're really glad you're here. We're excited for this morning. And we're going to move on to the next element of our service this morning. And Pastor's going to lead us in that. Before we jump in, I want to just uh, open our time in the Word with prayer. Uh, I would encourage you to be praying for uh, uh, Todd McCauley. Uh, many of you know what Todd has been through uh, this past month or so. And uh, Todd has to have uh, a hole in his heart repaired. And that is going to be a week from Tuesday, the 10th of May. And so remember Todd in your prayers this week. If you get an opportunity to see him or whatnot, encourage him. Uh, in that as well. But let's bow together and then we're going to uh, look at God's Word together. 
Father God, thank you so much for this morning. Uh, wonderful songs to sing, reminding us of the blessing that we have to experience as children of yours. That because of Jesus and because of his sacrifice on the cross for us, we have the opportunity to be forgiven. We have the opportunity to be a part of a family. We have the opportunity to experience your light and then reflect that some in the world in which we live. And I pray this morning as we think some about sort of a familiar song, uh, a familiar story, I mean, that you will use that in our lives to, to evaluate some of those things happening in us and just where each of us are uh, with you in our spiritual journey today. Uh, I pray for those in our church with different needs. It's great to see Roy here this morning. Continue to heal him, uh, strengthen that knee, and uh, encourage him during some of the challenges that he has been going through in his life. Uh, just really thankful for him, and I pray your blessing blessing over him today. I pray for Todd and Ashley, and as this next week, uh, Todd goes through that procedure, I pray that it will uh, solve uh, what has uh, caused the problems he's had with his heart. Uh, guide the doctors in that, and I pray, Lord, that that will go well, be successful, and that we'll be able to, as a church family, really encourage Todd. Uh, during this season of his life. Uh, Lord, again, thank you so much for all the different parts of this morning, the, the wonderful opportunity to pray over some babies, the opportunity a little bit later to think about communion and what those elements mean. But as now we sort of uh, narrow our attention, our focus on your word, give us eyes to see, ears to hear, hearts to understand what your spirit wants every one of us this morning to grab. And I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. How many of you know, I'm sure many of you do, what a misnomer is? This word just keeps popping up in different things that I've read. A misnomer is something that was misnamed. That's what the word means. So a misnaming may be a, named in a way that somehow misrepresents it. But misnomers are interesting. I'll give you some examples. And I you know, went, found a few different lists of uh, examples of misnomers. Chinese checkers is a misnomer because it's not a form of checkers, nor is it from China. Uh, it is a game that was invented in Germany, and its name was changed in the 1920s to make it more marketable so they could sell it. So there's one example. Starfish and jellyfish, both misnomers because neither of them are fish. Uh, they don't have a vertebrae, a skeleton like fish do. There's some other technical term, and all the scientists in the room can tell you later what those are. Uh, Panama hats don't come from Panama. They come from Ecuador. English horns did not originate in England, but in Poland. And they're not horns, but they're woodwind instruments. Bombay duck is a fish. Uh, it's a dish, it's a dish that serves, called Bombay duck, but it's a fish dish. And your funny bone, you all know this one, but your funny bone is not a bone. It is a nerve that runs by your elbow uh, that when you hit it is not funny at all. Uh, one that I found on the list, I hesitate sharing, but it showed up on the list of misnomers is buffalo wings. Now I know why they're called buffalo wings, and you know why they're called buffalo wings, but the naming itself is a misnomer because buffalo wings taste an awful lot like chicken, not like, not like buffalo. Um, misnomers are misnamed or named in a way that misrepresents them. Now, sometimes that is done intentionally. Oftentimes it's just unintentional uh, and just happens. In our family, we have our own personal misnomer story that is completely on me. It is 100% uh, my fault. But uh, Shell and I talked about this past week and can't really remember the specific details of how it transpired. But when our daughter Amanda was born, we decided in advance that her middle name would be Lynette. Um, the problem surfaced when we did not really discuss how to spell Lynette. Uh, Mom uh, assumed that Lynette would be spelled with two N's in it. And I, on the other hand, did not realize that. It was spelled in two N's, at least in Mom's mind. And so when the nurse came in to fill out the birth certificate, you know, the legal document that our daughter would carry with her for the rest of her, her life, um, for some reason Mom was not available. And so Dad spelled Lynette with one N instead of two N's. And um, she carries that to this day. We have our own personal misnamed story.
that it's one of those, you know, everybody has those family stories that come up around the Thanksgiving dinner table. Yeah, I remember this about me and that about me, and that's one of ours. Now, misnomers, I start with defining that and talking about it this morning because we're going to study a parable. That is a little bit of a misnomer. If you uh, open your Bible to where we're going to look today, we're going to look in, in Luke chapter 8. You'll probably find, just because it's this way in my Bible, uh, a, a caption over the section that we're going to look that it is uh, different than the way I want to look at it and the way that I really think it should look at it. we should look at it. It's usually called the parable of the sower. Sometimes it's described as the parable of the seed. And yet, in a, in a very real way, neither of those are accurate descriptions of the story that Jesus told. The way Jesus explains the parable, it's not so much about the sower, though that's important in any farming situation. It's not even so much about the seed though in this story that is really a central part of it, a key part of it. The parable in Luke chapter 8 is best understood as the parable of the soils. And that's why I put the title on uh, today's sermon for you if you got the sermon notes there, Dirt Matters. Now if you got a Bible or the Bible app on your phone, I would invite you to turn to Luke chapter 8 and we're going to look at the first 21 verses of that. Uh, the way the chapter opens, it gives us, it sort of pulls the curtain back on uh, some beside, behind the scenes working of Jesus' ministry during the three years in which he uh, walked on this earth and had that public ministry. It says in verse 1 this, After this, Jesus traveled about from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him, also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out. Joanna, the wife of Chusa, the manager of Herod's household. Herod's household. Susanna, and many others. These women were helping to support them out of their own means. Now, like I said, it pulls back the curtain a little bit. Jesus is traveling from town to town, especially in the northern region of Galilee, preaching the gospel, preaching the good news of the kingdom of God. And he's accompanied by his 12 disciples. They are named back in, in chapter 6. But we also here get to meet some others. This is the first time that Mary from Magdala, a little town on the rim of the Sea of Galilee, is mentioned, Mary Magdalene. And uh, Mary had been dominated by demonic activity. Uh, literally, it says there, possessed by seven demons. Hard to understand that or imagine what uh, her life was like before. But after encountering Jesus, she was completely cured of that. Joanna is someone else that was cured in some way. And she's identified here as the wife of the manager of King Herod's household. So pretty high up in the government there. And yet she's following Jesus. Susanna, others. There are this group of people that travel with Jesus, help fund this itinerant ministry somehow through their personal sacrifice. And they were, like the woman that we talked about, we looked at last week at the end of chapter 7, they were into individuals that had been forgiven much. They had encountered Jesus and he had changed their lives. Uh, they'd been rescued through meeting him and they were willing to sacrifice for him. They'd been forgiven much and they were uh, quick to uh, be generous in matching their understanding of their blessing. But that's sort of background that leads up to verse 4 and the introduction of this really familiar story. And uh, for filling in blanks, they're not too hard. The parable of the soils. Verse 4, while a large crowd was gathering and people were coming to Jesus from town after town, he told this parable. So Jesus is going to tell a story. It goes this way, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell on the path. It was trampled on and the birds ate it up. Some fell on rocky ground. And when it came up, the plants withered because they had no moisture. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up with it and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up and yielded a crop a hundred times more than was sown. When he said this, he called out, Whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. 
Now that's an interesting story about farming. Uh, it was an agricultural society. People knew about farming. People understood that. And many of you know about farming much better than I could ever uh, begin to understand. But in that setting, it made sense for Jesus to tell a story uh, wrapped up in our, uh, agriculture. Uh, they understood farming. But as Jesus tells that story, as this religious teacher in front of a, a hugely gathered crowd, he got to the end and just said, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. And I'm sure around the whole crowd that day, when he got to the end, most people said, well, that's kind of interesting. We know all that stuff already, right? What, what's the point? What, why would you tell that story? What was that all about? What were we supposed to learn from that story? And the fact that that was going through people's minds shows up in the very next verse, because even the disciples say, his disciples asked him what this parable meant, and he said, the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of God has been given to you. But to others I speak in parables, so that though seeing they may not see, though hearing they may not understand. Even the, even the 12, they, they say to Jesus, you know, that was, that's nice and all, but what does that mean? Uh, what difference should that make in our lives? What are you talking about there? And before turning to the answer key in the back, he's going to do that, and that's where we're going to focus our attention. Uh, Jesus diverges briefly to state why he was teaching in parables anyway. Uh, these stories would enlighten his disciples to spiritual truth, but those that were only there to, to find something, a way to trap Jesus, those that rejected him as the Messiah, those that turned away already in their hearts, they would, these stories would just seem like nonsense. And it was a way to share inside information with his disciples, but also leave the crowd wondering um, and thinking deeply and maybe seeking out more. But then he gives his guys the answer. And this is where we're going to focus most of our attention this morning. Uh, he says it's a parable about soil. So, verse 11. This is the meaning of the parable. The seed is the word of God. Those along the path are the ones who hear, and then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts, so that they may not believe and be saved. Those on the rocky ground are the ones who receive the word with joy when they hear it, but they have no root. They believe for a while, but in a time of testing, they fall away. The seed that fell among thorns stands for those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by life's worries, riches, and pleasures and they do not mature. But the seed on good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart who hear the word, retain it, and by persevering, produce a crop. Jesus says to his guys, you need to understand this story. It's not so much about the farmer. It's not so much even about the seed. It's about the soil. And the soil reflects the condition of every person's heart. Um, Every person's heart at any given moment is like one of those soil samples that Jesus mentioned and that Jesus described. Uh, different people respond to the Word of God differently because of the condition right then of their heart. And, and so uh, the goal Jesus hoped to accomplish was for people, especially his disciples, but I think even us today, to ask the question, okay, where's my heart today? How, how does my, what's the soil sample, what's the condition um, that my heart would represent and would connect with right now? Now, there's a couple levels to this that I think are really important to understand. Uh, levels to consider when you read this particular parable, and it's the level of salvation and the level of sanctification. And, and both of those are really important, and it's critical to take in both levels. Verse 11 says that the seed is the word of God, which, le which includes the good news of, the sal of the salvation. Um, the seed of the gospel leads to salvation, and it is only those who receive God's word, God's message of salvation, and it takes root in their, in their heart, and, and they receive it and bear fruit that they're demonstrating that they've truly been saved, that they truly uh, have been changed by their faith in Jesus Christ. The seed represents God's word about salvation. But the seed, as the word of God, represents a lot more than just salvation. The Bible is not just about 
how to have a relationship with God. It, it addresses so many other things in our lives. And I think that's important to consider because easily Christians might write this parable off as sort of irrelevant. Well, you know, I trusted Jesus for salvation. Uh, you know, at this point in my past, on that, on that given day, I had good soil the day of my conversion. So I'm clearly not the other soil types in here. Let's just move on. But that's dangerous. Jesus was talking to his disciples, those who had committed to follow him. And he wanted them to consider, uh, right then, what was the condition of their hearts. And I think for us, uh, both those levels matter. Because on any given day, any one of us can have any one of those four, four soil types reflected in our hearts. And we need to ask the question, where am I today? What's the condition of my heart right now? And it matters because the condition of your heart determines the direction of your life. The condition of your heart, the openness that you have in your heart to God's Word will determine the direction of your life. Um, so let's look at these four soil. Verse 11 and, tw and 12, he talks about hard soil. He talks about hard soil. Those along the path, the ones who hear, and devil comes along, takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. Farmers would plant seed by just sort of scattering it. You know, have a bag over the shoulder, just sort of scatter it. You don't have a lot of control over where it would land. And often the would seed would land on the path. Uh, the uh, area where everyone walked, and it was hardened down, it was beaten down, and so there's no way that that seed's going to take root. There's no way that that seed is going to grow anything. And so it becomes burnt seed. You know, it becomes an easy target for uh, the birds to just sweep in and scoop up and scarf it up as an easy meal. And in the answer key here, Jesus says, you know, the birds eating the seed on that hardened ground in my story, that re represents the devil. And Satan wants very much to sort of swipe in and, and, um, and hardened ground, take away that message of God's word so an individual doesn't respond to it and, and doesn't trust Jesus Christ. And at the salvation level, you probably know people, I think we all likely know people that are very strongly resistant to the gospel uh, of Jesus Christ. You know, maybe they had a bad church experience growing up. Maybe they got treated poorly by those that said they were Christians. Maybe they grew up in a context where Christianity wasn't really part of their life or was portrayed foolish, as a foolish thing. And so uh, they're just resistant to that. They're really just not interested. Uh, they don't want to hear uh, anything about your faith in Jesus Christ. We probably all know people like that. And, and a person with a hard, resistant heart is not an easy target for the gospel. Uh, Satan comes along, convinces them easily that that message about Jesus, that's all nonsense, and you don't need to waste your time listening to that, and so they don't. Now, being that you are here in church this morning, um, I doubt that you are completely hard-hearted to the gospel. But you might know people like that. You might know people that would fit in that category, that... Um, that uh, don't really want to hear anything about God, don't really want to hear anything about your faith. And I would encourage you, don't, don't give up on those people. God has a way of, of uh, getting seed down and uh, cracking the hardest of hearts uh, every summer out here in the parking lot. By about the middle of summer, we have to go out and spray all the things that are growing up in all those little cracks. And it just is mind-blowing to me that this black, hard surface, you know, uh, that uh, things can still, seeds can somehow find their way and can still grow up in that. And it's an illustration, I think. God has a way of reaching the hardest of hearted people. And so, don't give up. Keep praying. Keep sharing with with individuals that may be hard, hard soil people at the salvation level. But the second level, the sanctification level, that, that applies to all of us. Sanctification just re refers to how the, the process of growing and changing as a follower of God to become more and more like God. And we all need that. We all need to grow and change more and more every day. And we're, the process isn't going to be done until we are in the presence of Jesus and see him face to face. Now, and one of God's main tools in accomplishing our growth spiritually is through contact with his word in our lives. But here's the thing. It is possible... It is possible that even as a Christian, you let yourself, I let myself once in a while, develop kind of a hard heart. You know? 
And maybe life has sort of trampled you down. Maybe praying doesn't seem like it's accomplishing what I want God to do. Um, maybe hard things have compacted the soil of your heart. And when a heart gets hard, God's Word bounces off. It doesn't accomplish in us what God wants. And if you let that happen for too long, um, you stop growing, you stop changing, you stop seeing the progress God wants to see happen in your life. And so I would encourage this morning, you know, ask, is it possible that I've let myself kind of get a little hard to God's Word? Because that's one of the soil samples. That's the first one. Here's the second one. The second one is rocky soil. Verse 13, he said, Those on the rocky ground are the ones who receive the Word with joy when they hear it, but they have no root, so they believe for a while, but in the time of testing, they fall away. Throughout Israel, there is a lot of rocky soil, and that I don't just mean soil with rocks in it, but areas where there's a bedrock layer uh, that just has a very shallow uh, surface topsoil over that. And in those places, is what Jesus is describing here, seed just can't get rooted. You know, it, it, it can't set roots down through the layer of bedrock below, and even moisture, it doesn't stick around. It evaporates so quickly. And so uh, what might seem like initial germination, it dies so very quickly. And, and Jesus uses that, something that they would all understand. Uh, he compares that scenario to a person who, who hears the Word of God, who responds to it with emotion, um, but it never takes root. They appear to believe, but it doesn't last. And when life gets hard, when life gets hard, and testing arrives, they fall away. You notice that's specifically what he said. They believe for a while, but in the time of testing, in the time of trial, they turn away. Now, again, both levels are valuable to think through. Initially, we think of the salvation level, and it's quite possible that many people have gone through the motions of responding to the gospel. Uh, they prayed a prayer. They had an emotional, spiritual moment. They walked an aisle. They raised their hand. But that's all that it was. It's an emotional experience. Uh, they did not truly believe, and it did not take uh, deep root inside their hearts. Uh, and, and so, though they might point back to that and say, oh yeah, I, I did that Christian thing in my life, it's not changing who they are right now. They're not growing in their life right now. And that's something to be really concerned about. Because as people, we can even deceive ourselves that we're okay with God when we don't have a relationship with Him that is real. And it's concerning when it's re referring to people that you care about. We want our loved ones to be authentically saved uh, from hell. And every one of us cringes the, the possibility that maybe their profession isn't true. <laughs> And so it's valuable to, to consider the salvation level with this one. We each need to examine our hearts. And, and one reason why Sunday after Sunday you hear me come back to the gospel message is because we all need to hear it. We all need to think about it. We all need to examine our hearts and make sure that our response is authentic and real. Um, is, uh, is that decision of faith changing the direction of my life? Or... Am I counting on a moment in the past that seems to bear no connection to where I am right now? Salvation will produce steady and increasing and lifelong change and transformation. It'll show in your priorities, in your character, in your finances, in your life habits. And it'll show, maybe greater than any other time, it'll show when we come up against, face up against trials. <laughs> Uh, Jesus said that rocky soil people encounter testing and fall away. Authentic believers, when they encounter testing, respond in a different way. I, I was listening to an interview this past week by uh, Jonathan Gibson. He's a, a biblical scholar who uh, is, uh, teaches at Westminster Seminary, but also is a children's book author. He wrote the story, The Moon is Always Round. And um, he, uh, in this interview, he told the background for th that children's story. Several years ago, Jonathan and his wife, a three-year-old son, Ben, and uh, part of their bedtime routine every night was to go to the bedroom window, look out at the, at the moon. 
And you know this, every time you look at the moon, it's a little different than it was before, right? Especially if you take a few days break. Uh, you can sometimes see just a sliver of the moon. Sometimes you can see the whole moon. Sometimes you just see part of the moon. And uh, Jonathan and Ben every night would talk about how much they could see of the moon that particular night, how much light was shining from that. Uh, but then uh, Jonathan always made the, the point with his son that even though you don't see it all, they'll only see part of it, the moon is always round. The moon is always round. And, and that even though it can only see a sliver some nights, uh, the whole thing is there. And that pictures God. At times in our life, times in our life, you know, hard times, we might not see all that God is up to. It might just, we only see a sliver of light. But the moon is still round. And God is still fully present and working his will in our lives. Um, th what made the story uh, most memorable in hearing it and, uh, and became the basis for the book, the children's book that, that Jonathan decided to write, was um, what happened in their life uh, just sometime, a short time later. The practice was fully tested when Jonathan and his wife lost their uh, daughter through a late-term miscarriage. And he had to explain to Ben he had to explain to Ben what happened to his little sister. And like all of us in those kind of th situations, Ben was full of all kinds of questions that did, not have, that did not have any answers. And to work through it, Jonathan finally came back to the window. And that whole uh, discussion about, you know, we only see a little bit of light right now. It's not bright at all. But the moon's still round. And God's still at work. And we need to trust Him. People for whom salvation is real respond to testing differently. They turn to God's Word for help and for hope. And they, they choose to believe God's promises even if they don't see what He's doing. Uh, testing accomplishes that in our lives. And testing for true followers of Jesus can have a strengthening effect. I came across this recently. Back in, uh, back in the late 80s, there was a group of engineers, entrepreneurs, earth scientists that set out to build the perfect ecosystem here on earth. And they, they built this place in Oracle, Arizona. It's called Biosphere 2. It encompasses over three acres. And it's the largest, at least it was at the time, the largest closed system that was ever created. It was designed to be this ideal environment for things to grow. Uh, and, and so uh, plants should thrive. It was a climate controlled environment with purified air, clean water, nutrient rich soil, natural light. It was the perfect conditions perfect conditions for growth. And, and yet, despite what seemed like the perfect conditions, something curious kept happening. The trees that were planted in this, this biosphere area, they would, they would grow to a certain height and then they would just fall over. And after some head scratching, the scientists finally figured out what was wrong there, that this biosphere lacked one very critical component for healthy trees, and that is the wind in their natural habitat. You know, the wind, uh, trees are impacted by wind that blow them every which way, and trees respond to that wind by sinking their roots down. And in this environment without any breeze, without any wind at all, that was not happening. And so the strength was missing. And I think it is a really good illustration of how you know, when we go through trials, when things happen in our lives that are hard, that are challenging, that, that uh, winds that blow, storms that come, God uses that to sink roots down and to give us strength. And as we are open to God's Word, the testing in our lives make us better, not make us weaker. But for those with rocky soil, they don't have the roots. They don't have the relationship with God. They don't have the openness to God's Word in their life. And so, they fall away. Here's the third soil, thorny soil. 
I'll just word it this way, polite to listen, but too distracted to be transformed. You know, and, and again, there's value to look at this soil uh, sample from both levels. For the person who needs to respond to the gospel, experience salvation, it's quite possible they, they've heard that. Maybe they've heard it many times, but there's so many other things, you know, so much to be distracted by, uh, that they don't respond. And you all know this, life is full of all kinds of stuff that pull people away. And we all have jobs and family concerns and personal problems and, and we, we have pressure and possessions. Even good things can distract people uh, from really considering their need for salvation and choosing to respond. But it's not just those that need to respond to the, the good news of the gospel. It is all of us. Um, how often do we let life's worries, riches, and pleasures um, and what Jesus mentions there choke out the impact of God's Word in our lives. Uh, our oldest son, uh, Justin, and his wife bought a house in Indy a couple years ago. And I was talking to him this past Monday. He's focused this spring on uh, doing some projects in the backyard. Uh, it's an older neighborhood, and so there's a lot of trees and, and whatnot, and a lot, not a lot of opportunity for grass to grow very well. So he's trying to work on that. But one thing that, that uh, they have in the, along the backyard, the back fence line of their yard, uh, are a series of trees, but also vines that have and just scattered all over the ground and have grown up in each one of those trees. And he was telling me when I talked to him this past week about how he took a whole day to sort of cut every one of those vines off at the base and yank them down and how much the trees already feel like, it look like, they're doing better. Um, because of those vines just choking the life out of those trees. And, and that's a picture of what Jesus is talking about here. Life is full of things, full of stuff. Uh, hard things, good things, joys and pleasures and worries and fears. And those can just sort of choke the life out of God's Word growing in our lives. And it happens so easily. And to whatever degree we allow life's stuff to distract us from responding to God's Word, we're right then operating with some thorny, thorny soil. Now there's only one more here, verse 15. It says, uh, But the seed on good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart, who hear the Word, retain it, and by persevering, produce a crop. Good soil, open to hear, open to receive, open to obey, and bear fruit from the impact of God's Word. Uh, this last type of soil is the, the heart condition that each one of us need. At salvation, uh, good soil, heart, hears the gospel, responds to the message of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, and puts their faith uh, faith in Jesus for salvation from their sins. And I hope that you've experienced that. I hope that you have um, uh, experienced uh, that moment of faith in your life. And if you haven't, that today you'd settle that. that today you'd make that decision. Um, if you do, and when you do, good things begin to grow. Your life begins to change. Uh, it'll show evidence. One of the writers that I was reading and studying this said, good soil is recognized as good only when fruitfulness has become evident. In other words, uh, the best way to know that you have a good soil response to God's Word is when you start to change, when something begins to grow, when your life is different than it was before. And if you respond to the Gospel of Jesus, it will, it will change your life. There'll be evidence. And while it seems to be disconnected, it really is not. The, the next little portion of this chapter highlights for me what I think are some results, some fruit, if you will, some things that ought to grow. If you have good soil in your heart, the results of roots in good soil uh, are very clear. Verse 16, it says, No one lights a lamp and hides it in a clay jar, puts it under a bed. Instead, they put it on a stand so that those who come in can see the light. For there is nothing hidden that will not be disclosed, nothing concealed that will not be known or brought out into the open. Therefore, consider carefully how you listen. Whoever has will be given more. Whoever does not have, even what they think they have, will be taken from them. One of the results of good soil is that we, we will shine. We'll have a commitment to shine. Those who respond to God's Word will reflect the light of God's Word in their life. Uh, one of the old-time favorite kids' songs contained the line, This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Um, uh, that comes from Jesus' teaching, and his point is really clear. That if God's Word has taken root in your life, it's going to be noticeable. And you won't want to hide that. 
you'll show His change in your life. If God's Word has taken root, His light will be present in your life and you'll be willing to shine. That's um, a result of, of good soil. Uh, and so is this last one. Verse, uh, verse 19, Now Jesus' mother and brothers came to see Him, but they were not able to get near Him because of the crowd. Someone told them, Your mother and brothers are standing outside wanting to see you. He replied, My mother and brothers are those who hear God's Word and put it into practice. Now, I wanted to include all the way down to that verse because with Jesus' answer to uh, His disciples there, He makes a connection back to the good soil. It makes a connection back to the seed planted in good soil. It uh, shows in obedience. It shows in growth. It shows in, in change in life. And, you know, we, we read that there. Uh, this little scenario unfolding of his mother and his brothers uh, stopping by. And, and Jesus' reply, he, it wasn't intended as an insult to his mom. Uh, Jesus was making a point that for those that have good soil, those that respond to that, Word of God, they let the seed of the Word of God settle in their heart and it grows and it changes them. They put their faith in Christ for salvation, but then it changes them in every single day of the way that they live life. It also brings something else. It brings the dynamic of a greater family. They're connected to God's family. And I think it is placed here intentionally by, by Luke as he put all this together to say that's one of the best evidences that you have good soil. And that God's Word has taken root in your life. Uh, you're willing to shine and you're connected to God's family. If you have a good soil heart and have welcomed the seed of God's Word for salvation, you'll be willing to shine in a dark world and you want to stay connected to God's family. And in the realm of... Uh, of uh, Christian, uh, daily Christian living, as God's Word is rooted and as we're open to hear from God uh, and His book every single day, uh, it'll shape us, it'll change us. It makes us people that stand out, that have a light in this world. And it makes us, gives us a desire to gather with our church family to worship and link and learn and serve. It all kind of ties together. The dirt matters. And it matters that you see yourself in Jesus' story. Because I drive an old VW and kind of a VW geek, um, people often send me different VW-related things. Uh, numerous times, I can't tell you how many times, I have uh, received or been tagged in Facebook, whatever, with this photo. Uh, it showed up online in 2016. And the person that first posted it uh, identified it as being taken at the Cleveland Museum of Natural History. Uh, soon after, in the, the actual you know, insect display at the Cleveland Museum of Natural History, and soon after it first made the rounds on the internet, there was a Cleveland news station that decided they would investigate it to find out if this was really authentic you know, or not. And so they went to the museum and interviewed the director of communication there. Her name is uh, Glenda Bogar, and found out, and I read this news article published by the uh, news agency there in, in Cleveland. But uh, she mentions in the article that there, that is actually an accurate picture, that there is a little VW pin in the insect display, and that it has been there for years and years and years. Uh, and in fact, she said there are many other hidden objects throughout the museum as sort of fun ways to engage people that are at the museum. Uh, and this was the point, she said, an encouragement for people to look closer than they tend to look at museum displays. Now, if you've ever taken, been on a field trip with second graders or something like that at a museum, you know, you know, they're more interested in what's for lunch than they are really looking close at what that display holds and, and all of that sort of thing. But, but I thought of that this past week because it's not just, you know, little kids in a museum that have that problem. We all tend to not look as close as we ought to look. And that is especially true uh, when you think about your own personal spiritual journey. And I want to invite you this morning. Look a little closer than you tend to look. Think about where your heart is today. Um, and, you know, I said at the beginning, the direction of your life is determined by the condition of your heart. And so it really is important that constantly, constantly we dig up some dirt.
in our own heart and we look at, okay, am I hard to God's Word today? Am I being distracted by so many other things? Um, am I letting the worries of life ch choke out my openness to hear from God today? Or do I have good soil? Um, how receptive am I? How receptive are you uh, to God's Word and the influence of God's Word in your life? This so morning we're going to end our service with the uh, communion elements. And I think it's a really good way to tie this all together. And so I want to pray for a minute. If you did not get one of these little uh, kits and you would like one, feel free while I'm praying uh, to uh, slip out and grab one. But let's talk to God, and then we're going to talk about those elements here for just a moment. Father God, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for the opportunity to think about, think about the condition of our own hearts. Think about where we each are with you and... Um, whether we're as open to your word and open to the truth uh, of Scripture as we ought to be. And not just on any given day, but on this day, on this morning. Uh, where is our heart? What condition is our heart? And to whatever degree, Lord, that we would recognize, you know what, I've been kind of hard. I'm not really listening. I'm not really paying attention at all to God. That we'd be open to the Holy Spirit's using some tools to break that up. To whatever degree we might identify, you know what, Lord, I, I've let myself get so distracted by so many other things. It just, life is full of stuff and I just haven't let, taken the time to let the roots of your word dig deep. Uh, Father, I pray we'd be honest to admit that and, and willing to change it. And all of us have worries and cares and other things that can sort of choke our attention away from your word. And this morning, my prayer is that if that we're honest enough to identify that and say that, that you'd help us this week to do some things differently, uh, to uh, prioritize time to hear from your word and let it really settle settle into our soul. We're all in a different place. But it's important that we look closer, that we think deeper about where we are, what needs to change in our lives, so that your word can have the impact that it needs to have. I pray that all in Jesus' name. Amen.